responsive reading today is taken from our Chalice Worship Book, page 160. The unity of the church is a gift of God and Jesus Christ to be made visible before the world. The first and people of God are, by reasons of grace, nationality, politics, litigation, or religious heritage, we belong to one another. By our creation in the image of God and by baptism into the one body of Christ. Just as Christ is undivided, so it is essential that the church be one. Amen. <laughs> Our scripture reading today is taken from Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 15. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without murmuring and arguing, so that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation in which you shine like stars in the world. The word of God for the people of God. Good morning. Good to see you all this morning. For those of you who were here last week, you know that we are blessed and fortunate to be sharing a faith goal together for the next few weeks and if you've not been a part of last week and if you're here for the first time this week there's nothing to be overly concerned about last week we looked at philippians chapter one this week we're looking at philippians chapter two just a portion of that together collectively next week chapter three and then the final week chapter four and Part of the method to all of this, so that you all know, is that we're recognizing that we are growing as a community of faith and our understanding about what it means to be a community of faith, what it means to be the church. And it's interesting, and it's more than interesting, it's, um, it's powerful in a way. I just, I, some of you may have noticed that I came in a little bit later than I normally do, and Sam Fulmer stopped me and wanted to hand me some material that they've been working on, the Sunday school class and beyond, and looking at what it means to be a member of the church. What does it mean to be a member of the church? And it's interesting that this is emerging in a number of different ways. Last week we saw that Paul had written his letter to the church in Philippi, and he was addressing it to the saints, which is every member of the church. A saint 
sainthood as the early church understood it had nothing to do with merit. It was not that there was an ordaining body or a church with a hierarchy that decided that some people were saints and some that were not. Everyone is a saint. And it was also written to the elders and the deacons. Now that's important for us as a community of faith, the Christian church, disciples of Christ, because we recognize those areas of leadership. And so I want you to prayerfully consider how we can discern what that means in a faithful way. And so we can both adhere to those aspects of our background and our tradition that are consistent with what it means to be a member, a saint of the body of Christ, as well as what it means to be an elder, a deacon, and other roles within the church. I mention this also because I want us to recognize as the body of Christ that for the next week, we this happens to be for all over the world, a week of prayer for Christian unity. And this theme keeps emerging, and it really does. I want you to think about, if you recall, in the Super Bowl's coming up here in a couple of weeks, at the Super Bowl, that theme of one came up. And we're recognizing whether it's a country music artist, whether it's another music artist, whether it's a Super Bowl, this emphasis on one. It's like the whole world is concerned about oneness. Our whole world, and you don't have to be religious in nature to recognize that there's a, there's a disintegration, there's a fragmentation within our personal life. We need not look any further than ourselves to recognize that. We recognize that relationships are strained within our families. Relationships are strained interpersonally. Relationships are strained, within, estranged and strained within churches. Our cities, our politics, internationally, there just seems to be so much division from within and from without. And so I want to read to you a prayer that I discovered as I was looking at this theme of unity. And it is, it is interesting to me also that we as the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, we are a community of faith that was founded on the principle of unity, that if we are a part of the body of Christ, we are called to oneness, we are called to unity. And before we invite our prayer concerns and joys, I'm going to read a portion of this, and then when you hear me say, uniting Holy Spirit, when you hear those words, uniting Holy Spirit, I invite you to respond, hear our prayer. Can we do that together? As we observe this week of prayer for Christian unity. We pray, O oh God, for a deeper understanding of Christ's union with his church and his will for it, and for the renewing action of your Holy Spirit so that your church may become one. Uniting Holy Spirit, hear our prayer. We pray for a growing awareness of the scandal of Christian divisions among the different churches. Uniting Holy Spirit, hear our prayer. We pray for the awakening of a desire of Christians in this land to meet together, to work and witness and worship together Uniting Holy Spirit, hear our prayer. We pray for a better cooperation among all branches of Christ's church so that the oneness of your holy Catholic and apostolic church in which we believe and to which we belong may become manifest. Uniting Holy Spirit, hear our prayer. We pray for all who are seeking church union in this land that they may grow into such unity, worship, and mission as will please you through Christ, the head of the church. Uniting Holy Spirit, hear our prayer. We pray for the ecumenical movement and for all who suffer, pray, and work in the cause of unity, that all these efforts may bear good fruits to the honor and glory of your most holy name, uniting Holy Spirit, hear our prayer. And we pray for your spirit of truth and love to guide those who are working toward Christian unity and for more and more earnestness and faithful prayer for unity, uniting Holy Spirit, hear our prayer. Amen. I invite you now to share your joys and concerns, any celebrations that you may have or anything that is weighing heavily on your heart and mind that you would like to share with the community of faith so that we can better pray together in a unified and oneness way. If you'll just simply raise your hand, someone will deliver a microphone to you and we would love to hear from you. All right, then it is my privilege. Most gracious and loving God, we thank you for this community of faith. We thank you for the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. We thank you for the early founders who recognized that division within your body sends the wrong message to those who would be drawn close to you. 
We thank you for your love that unifies us all. We thank you that we are created by you, our one common creator, our mother, our father, our all in all, which makes us, each and every one of us, brothers and sisters. And so we pray for a greater awareness of that. And as brothers and sisters, we thank you for those opportunities to share our celebrations. We thank you for your love that awakens us to the realization that where one part of the body celebrates, all parts celebrate, and where each or any of us suffer, all of us suffer. Help us to see how interconnected we really are. We pray for further integration and wholeness within ourselves. We pray for that peace that we speak of, but we pray for that peace that is a reality greater than our words can form. We pray for that peace within us where nothing is missing and nothing is broken emotionally, spiritually, mentally, relationally. We know that the beginning of our wholeness begins with our relationship with you as we begin to know just how much you love us. And recognizing how much you love us, we recognize that while you consider each one of us special, your love knows no bounds, that your love is both particular and universal for each one of us particularly and for all of us universally. We thank you that as we receive your love, as we receive your forgiveness, we are liberated to love others and to forgive others, and that true healing begins then. We ask that healing would begin with us and our families and our community of faith and to extend beyond to this community in which we reside. And even as those first disciples made up of 12, through the teaching and the power of the Holy Spirit, began to transform the world, we pray that you would continue to transform the world by those of us who were gathered here in Washington, North Carolina, in this particular time, in this particular place. We pray that just as the Holy Spirit was poured out upon those who had gathered from different places, different nations, different denominations, that that power gave them the ability to see you as you are, to see one another as they were, we pray for that same ability to see you, ourselves, and one another as you see us. And in so doing, may Christ be lifted up into our bodies and through our words and through our witness so that when others see us, they see not just us, but the one living in and through us. We ask these things in his name, even as we pray the prayer that he taught us when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy name.
Good morning. Um, for once, I've been doing my homework and reading through Philippians 2. I, in my Bible, when I, something hits my heart, I highlight it. And then if it hits my heart again, I underlined it. And when I opened Philippians 2, there were words that came to me that struck home without complaining or murmuring and becoming like-minded. And as we come to this table this morning, I wanted to emphasize that we, as we become Christians and we become wanting to walk and be like Jesus, we want to do it without complaining and murmuring. We want to become more like-minded like him. This table is an open invitation to all. It is for us to rededicate ourselves each week, to refresh ourselves, to encourage our souls, to give us the strength to get through the week. Will you pray with me? Dear Lord, we want to ask for blessings on this bread, your body broken for us. And likewise, Lord, we want to ask blessings on this cup. May it help refresh our souls. May it give us strength to get through the week. And may it give us encouragement, Lord. In your name, Jesus. Amen. We remember that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. He gave thanks and he blessed it. He said, this is my body. Take this in remembrance of me. And likewise, he took the cup of wine. He says, this is the cup of my salvation, my covenant with you for everlasting life. Let us remember that this is the Lord's table with an open invitation from all from him.
The great and, and blessed St. Francis reminds us that it is in giving that we receive. So give if you're able, and if you are able to give, give as you're able. Let us pray. Lord, we appreciate the blessings that you've bestowed upon us. Now we present some of those back to you with love, kindness, and our wishes and desires that you use these gifts that we give back in a manner which further the word of the church and love.
occasions when I arrive at this lectern that I have the impulse to go ahead with the benediction. And now may the love of God, after one of those songs that just says everything that I was prepared to say this morning. So unfortunately from you all, since I've gone through the trouble of trying to organize some thoughts, there's another 15 or 20 minutes of standing between you and lunch to feed your bodies. We really do have an opportunity. I hope that we recognize it over these next few weeks. If you can be present with us physically, if you have to be away, if you weren't here last week, that's okay. We're walking again through the book of Philippians and what I've challenged each of us to do, which I believe can be a transformative experience for us all, is to read through the book of Philippians. It's only four chapters. Do that in one sitting once a week. And if you haven't done it thus far, this is not one of those obligations or moral codes that you pass or fail. It's, it's not about that. It's about our ongoing transformation, each one of us personally and all of us collectively. And that song that we just sang that was written by Beth, I believe it picked up that rhythm so well, that rhythm between being fed and nourished, receiving the joy of God, receiving the love of God, receiving the light of God, and then witnessing to that love, letting that, that joy, that love, that light shine through us, come through us so that the world may see it. Because salvation... I think properly understood and as Jesus intended it has so much more to do than with merely our immortal souls. God wants to heal us, God wants to save us, God wants to restore us in every place that we are broken, that we are hurt, where we are suffering, where we are strained in our emotions, in our minds, in our relationships. God wants to restore things to be one, one in the sense of there is one will, God's one will that is operative in all of our lives, and God's will is always one of love, always one of peace, always one of life, life-giving, that which enriches our life, not that which would diminish our life or strain us or burden us. That's not God's intention. And this passage that we see, we see again that emphasis on oneness, Oneness with God, oneness within ourselves, and oneness with one another. That this oneness, although we are many, we are one. Although we are many members of the body of Christ, we are all part of the one body of Christ. And as I mentioned during, during our time of prayer, this denomination, and this is the reason I selected this denomination, our denomination has been focused on oneness. Those early founders happened to be members and ministers of the Presbyterian Church, and I have a high regard and the utmost respect for the Presbyterian Church, but these particular Presbyterian ministers recognized when they were at a revival and the Holy Spirit was experienced in ways that they had not beforehand experienced, and they began to see that they were Methodist and they were Baptist and they were Presbyterians and they were non-denominational people, and they all came together and they received communion together. And they believed that that was a vision, that was an insight into the way that God had created us, not to be separate, not to be distinguished from one another, that our very witness is in our unity, dating back to the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out and they were given supernatural abilities, but those abilities were not an end in themselves. Those abilities were to foster oneness. They were able to speak in different languages that they had never learned before. They weren't speaking gibberish. They were speaking languages that they had never taught, perhaps never heard of. And they were given the ability to speak in another language so that everyone could be unified. This is foundational to what it means to be a Christian. It's foundational for our personal lives. And I feel like I can't reiterate this enough. This is not just a vision for the world, though it is a vision for the world. This has extraordinary implications for each and every one of our personal lives. It impacts our families. It impacts the local church. It affects the city that we live in. It really does. It, it, there's no way to overstate the degree to which this message is of central importance to us. So I want to call our attention to a couple of matters. In our culture, at least in the part in the region of the country that I grew up in, ambition was considered a very important virtue even. We were supposed to be, we are supposed to be people of strong ambition. A person who is ambitious is recognized as someone who desires to be successful, to pursue greatness, to accomplish something important. And we should all have instilled with us, within us this even passion, passionate ambition. But Paul gives us a word of instruction here 
And it's not the first time he's used this phrase, selfish ambition, selfish ambition. And leading up to these words, he says, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, have the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Now, I want to say just a couple of words about that word same. For many of us, we think that to have the same mind means that we have the same opinion about every matter. And that's not what Paul is getting at here. In the same way that we saw last week that we are to strive side by side with one mind, with one mind, it doesn't mean same minded, it means that we are one minded, that we are all pursuing, that we are all striving, we're all trying to think in ways that will unite us, that will make us one, that will reconcile us, that will restore us, that, we will, that will heal us interpersonally, collectively, that's what it means to be one minded not same-minded, but this word is different. This word same is the Greek word autos, autos, which is translated often self. Consider yourselves as one self, one collective self, not independent, but interdependent. Not individual in the way that we think of individual, but connected to one another, one body, many parts. Think of yourselves as one self, one extended self. What affects any one of us directly affects all of us indirectly. Now, it's hard, I think, for us to get our minds around that as a community of faith, but let's consider those who are nearer to us, those with whom we are in relationship, our families, those closest relationships. And I want you to think about this for a moment. One of the greatest pains we know as human beings is not physical. The greatest pain that we experience is when we are estranged from those who are closest to us, isn't it? When something's happened, when we've injured someone that we love, when someone we love has injured us, there is no greater pain than that when those that we are closest to, that relationship has been injured, it's been fractured, it's been bruised, it's been strained. This is what it means to be one-minded, to be reconciling, to have that love. I know I use that word every week, and sometimes because of people's associations, it gets reduced to sentimentality, but it's anything but sentimentality. It includes our emotions, but it's so much more than our emotions. It is the power of love to take the initiative, to do what is necessary to restore that relationship, to find the strength within us. Let's say we are the injured party, and so now someone wants to be reconciled to us. The extraordinary capacity that can only be empowered by the gift of the Holy Spirit to forgive someone who has hurt us deeply, profoundly, so that we can be one, so that relationship can be restored. Because as we're carrying that pain, there is no wholeness. It robs us of our joy. It robs us of our contentment. So we're encouraged not to do anything from selfish ambition, any pursuit that would lead us to be apart from another, to stand out in a prideful way, to be better than another. All of these things fragment ourselves, our souls, our relationships, our communities, our nation, and internationally. And I believe we have here the vision, the path to peace within, peace among us, peace for the world. So let's look at this even more closely. Each one of us has an ambition. Each one of us has a fundamental ambition in the way that we often understand it in our society, that there's something we're pursuing, there's something that motivates us. By motivation, maybe it means that motivation not to pursue something, the motivation to remain complacent. For some of us, our primary Ambition is to make sure that our finances will live longer than we do. That's understandable. For some of us, our ambition is security. We're afraid there's a threat all around us and around every corner. So what motivates us is that we would be secure and safe. We want to be safe. We all have different ambitions. For some of us, we have an ambition that was instilled in us by a primary caregiver, someone we looked up to. And for some of us, we're still pursuing an ambition that someone instilled in us, and now that person has gone on 
and is in heaven looking at us and we're trying to carry on their ambition because it was their ambition and they gave us their ambition and now it's our ambition and I wonder if it's the case that some of those who have gone on before us are looking at us and they wish they could send a message and say you know what I so appreciate that you're trying to carry out my ambition but if I could get a message to you I was wrong about that ambition stop pursuing that ambition I know you love me, and because you love me, you're trying to fulfill my ambition, but I wish I could tell you don't. That's not the one to pursue. Because we were all called to pursue one ambition. All of us who are followers of Jesus, not mere believers in Jesus, those who are trying to follow his way, and his way is the way of one. It is always the way of love. It is not looking to define ourselves by who we're not, which is an early stage of spiritual development, where we understand ourselves as being righteous because we're not like those others who are unrighteous. Because we don't recognize who we are in Christ, how much God loves us, for who we are, we look at others to determine who we are not. And in some ways, our definitions of ourselves are negative definitions, who we are not. And the world is divided even more. And because we've not received the love of God, we're still divided within ourselves. And so we see this path. It begins with our minds, and we've talked about that on a regular basis. Paul says, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ. Christ Jesus. If we're going to have a mind of someone as followers of Jesus, we want the mind of Christ. And these following words are arresting words. If we pray with ears to hear what is being said to us, these are very arresting words. And we should pray for the discernment to be able to understand what they mean for for us. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped at, clung to, exploited. He didn't hang on to that status. But he emptied himself of that status, that rank, that highest rank, taking the form of a slave. There's no lower status among humanity than a slave. And Jesus, who is equal with God, is willing to empty himself of that kind of glory and rank and status and take on the form of a slave. Now, see, that's not emptying himself of divinity. It's in divinity's nature to empty self of status and rank and to lift up the lowest status to the highest status. And being born in human likeness and being found in human form He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. This is a mysterious statement that is made. What does it mean that we are to have the mind of Christ and that we are to humble ourselves and become obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross? What does that mean that we are to become obedient to God even to the point of death, death on a cross. This is my personal opinion, and people disagree with me, and I encourage people to disagree with me, and I encourage that we remain in dialogue and we come to a greater sense of the truth, because my desire, just as I pray your desire, is not that I be right. I'm not interested in being right. I'm interested in knowing the truth, approximating the truth. I'm interested in God's word for us. I'm interested in God's truth. I'm not interested in a tradition. I'm not interested in an orthodoxy. I'm interested in knowing what God's message to us is in powerful passages like this one, that we are to become obedient even to the point of death. What does that mean, death on a cross? This is how I understand it. Like you and me, Jesus was fully human. And Jesus was fully divine in this way, and that's a stumbling block for a lot of people. How could Jesus be fully human and fully divine? in the way that you and I have an opportunity to become increasingly divine. Jesus was in the garden experiencing a test that I pray none of us ever encounter. 
And as he was looking around at those that he had been in close contact with, with for three years, his best friends, those who were closest to them, who wouldn't even remain awake to pray, he was in the garden. And this is an opportunity for us to see the nature of Jesus. And sometimes we read over these things, and we read over that passage where Jesus says, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not my will, but your will be done. And we read over that as a powerful passage, but I wonder if we get it. Most of us don't go around calling our parents father and mother in an official capacity. In fact, we know that Jesus would often cry out, Abba, Daddy, Dad. So I'm wondering if in this passage where Jesus was trying to understand the will of the Father and what it was going to mean for him to carry out his dad's will, I can imagine him in the garden to the point of tears, and we know that he was sweating to the place of sweating blood, and we know that that's medically possible, the angst that he was under the extreme burden that he was under, and he's praying to his dad, 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 if there's any other way. I don't know if there's any other way. I don't want to do this. Dad. But he could hear the voice of his dad. He could hear the voice of his parent. He could hear the voice of the one that loved him so much and said, I don't desire that you were sacrificed. It is not my will. My heart is broken over this situation, but there were people who heard my voice when you were baptized. This is my son, my beloved. With him I am well pleased. Some of your disciples, when you were transfigured, heard the voice come to them. This is my son, my beloved. Listen to him. This is my son. This is my son. This is my son. You are my son. They know you as my son. They know you as the one who do, does what I do. So I need them to know how much I love them. I need them to know how much I love them. I need them to know that when your disciples run from you, I need them to know how I'm going to respond. I need them to know those who were chanting, Hosanna, 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 and then they turned and shouted, crucifying. I need them to know. I need to know. I need them to know. The ones who stripped you of your clothing and placed that crown on your head. Those that were mocking you. Those who made you carry that cross and you buckled under its weight. When they nailed you to a cross through your wrist and through your through your ankles. I need them to know how I would respond. You are my son and you're showing them my nature. And I need them to know that I forgive them no matter what because they've been told to fear me. They've been told to be afraid of me. They've been told that I'm going to come down on them. I need them to know that there's nothing that is going to separate us there's nothing is going to separate them from my love. I need them to know. And Jesus says, not my will, but your will be done. Whatever love requires, whatever it takes, I will witness to your love to the very, very end. And we are called to have the same mind of Christ in us that there's nothing we wouldn't do to witness to God's love. Whatever happens, will respond in love. Whatever happens, we will remain one-minded. In this pathway is our freedom. I believe it is our freedom. For many of us, we're pursuing things. We're trying to accomplish something. We want to be known by who we are in society. We're seeking to be accepted and acceptable. We want to be beautiful enough, attractive enough, smart enough. We want people to accept us because there's this longing within each of us to be accepted. And Jesus, through Paul, is telling us, you are accepted. I love you just as you are. Be free of those pursuits. Be free of that which tells you you're not acceptable, that voice in your head, that society norm, those things. Shine as bright as stars with my love and acceptance. I believe we are given the opportunity for real purpose, which is always the glorification of God, the glorification of God's love, the joy, the light, the love that they see in us. Let it shine through us, and they won't see merely us. They'll see the one in us. 
and we'll recognize the power of our ongoing transformation where we are becoming one. We are becoming one. We are becoming whole as we yield to the power of God, as we yield to the power of love. Within our lives, we're becoming whole. And now I'm able to love my spouse. I'm able to love my children. I'm able to love my neighbors. I'm able to love my brothers and sisters in the church. I'm able to love those that I used to perceive as enemies. And now I recognize they too are in bondage by the things that held me in bondage. And I don't judge them. I'm not judgmental. They're not my enemy. They're my opportunity to conversion through the greatest power of conversion the world knows. And that's through love. I'm being transformed in the same way that Jesus says, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. And a Roman soldier looks at him and says, surely this was the Son of God when they've thrown everything at us and we still love them and they're converted by the power of love and we are transformed and the world is transformed. What is your primary ambition? I want to close this morning with a quotation, and yes, it's still morning, with a quotation it's found in Brian Mahan's book, and I encourage you to read it. Some of it can be a little bit difficult to read. It's very witty, but it's very powerful. It's called Forgetting Ourselves on Purpose. Forgetting Ourselves on Purpose. And the subtitle is Vocation and the Ethics of Ambition. And he quotes Thomas Merton in this book. He says, if you want to identify me, ask me not where I live or how I comb my hair, but ask me what I think I'm living for in detail. And ask me what I think is keeping me from living fully for the thing I want to live for. I'm gonna repeat that. If you want to identify me, ask me not where I live or how I comb my hair, but ask me what I think I'm living for, what my ambition is. Ask me in detail and ask me what I think is keeping me from living fully for the one ambition I want to live for. My prayer for us this morning is that our ambition, our pursuit, our goal, our highest aim, is the will of God, the will of love, beginning with me, beginning in our family, beginning in our community of faith, beginning in our city, beginning in our nation, until the kingdom of God is one on earth as it is in heaven. When Jesus' prayer is fulfilled, that we may be one. Amen. If there's anyone here this morning who has never made a confession of faith, we're making more than a statement about what we believe. We're making a commitment to follow the way of the one, the way that heals us, the way that sets us free, the way that restores all things. If there's someone who is not a part of a community of faith, to greater and greater degrees, from our elders to our deacons to every member to every Sunday school class to every small group, we are struggling to do God's will, to know God's will, to love one another with the love of God. If that is the kind of community of faith you would like to be a part of, we will welcome you with open arms and celebrate the journey together. If there's someone here who needs to rededicate your life, even as I rededicate mine where I stand, some of you may want to come forward, but I invite us all to invite Christ to shine in our lives and say, is this the way of one? If we don't know, invite God to say it. If, is this the right motivation and ambition? If we are not convinced of that, invite God to show us what our true motivation is, what our true ambition is, and to set us on the course of God's ambition. I invite you to stand as you're able as we respond to God's leading.